Kuz Azampo and a very warm welcome to Bhutan This Week, our weekly news magazine program with me, Sunam Bim. Our top stories this week. Her Majesty the Gelsen launched Selwa, an organization to help persons with disabilities. OAG takes seven people to court, including the Labor Ministry's DG, for involvement in overseas employment scandal cases. And Bema Thizok wins Mr. Bhutan title for the second time. Her Majesty the Gelsen graced the launch of Selwa, an organization that will support and complement programs for persons with disabilities. The organization will also support other organizations that work with persons with disabilities. Selwa aims to enable every person with disabilities in the country to lead meaningful, integrated and dignified lives in society. This will ensure the inclusion of persons with special needs in all aspects of development, education, growth and employment, accessibility to facilities and other opportunities. The executive director of Selwa said it is important for any organization and individual to consider the need of persons with special needs in every program and activity. Selwa is partnering with Busian International Social Welfare Organization, Japan Overseas Cooperative Organization, the GOI Architectural Research Center, and Daishizen. Busian is a Japan-based international social welfare organization. A memorandum of understanding was signed between Busian and Selwa at the event today. Her Majesty the Gelsen works closely with the various organizations and agencies in Bhutan towards enhancing the well-being of persons with disabilities and creating a more inclusive society. Kiladim for BBS News. Bullying is quite common in Bhutan, but it is mostly unreported. Bullying can take several forms, although the most common seem to be peer bullying in schools. In an effort to stop this, a youth-led group called the Generation Y Youth has been carrying out anti-bullying education across schools in the country. Growing up in a small village in the east, 23-year-old Karma Wangda was always anxious to go to school. One memory that Karma says he would rather forget of his school days is of the extreme teasing he suffered, which made his school years terrible. Undergoing harsh emotional transition, Karma says he even reached a point where he wanted to give up on life. We are all five siblings, and five of us have different father or one mother. And people used to name us in different ways and like it doesn't sound uh, feasible if I say, like in local dialect, we popularly like call it as a kokti in Shashup, and people used to title me with these names. La. And uh, every time in in the classroom, they used to like uh, sometimes track me, sometimes like looking at my judging my physical appearance. They used to title me with different nicknames. La. As a victim of bullying himself, Karma always wanted to do something to stop bullying. With this in mind, he set up Project Generation Y Youth in 2018, which carries out anti-bullying campaigns and vigorous advocacy against peer bullying in schools. Today, his motivational sessions have reached out to more than 47,000 students in 27 schools. In Karma's visits across the country, he has found that these days, bullying also happens at homes in the form of molestation. Peer bullying is not only the case in Bhutan, la. and there is like uh, there are many other issues like which are not reported. La. That's why Generation Y youth is there to like uh, reach the unreached one. La. According to UNICEF, bullying is a form of aggressive behavior that occurs in an intentional and repeated manner, causing another child to feel hurt. As per studies, bullying can lead to potential psychological health problems such as depression, anxiety and suicidal attempts. Worldwide, 
close to 130 million students aged 13 to 15 have experienced bullying, and Bhutan seems to be no exception. Samson Dolker, BBS News. The Bumtang District Court dismissed a child trafficking allegation made against a 31-year-old woman by the Office of the Attorney General. The court instead fined the woman who is from Punaka for illegal transportation of an 8-year-old Indian child and negligence of the child after the child suffered grave injuries while staying with the defendant. The district court amended the child trafficking accusation to illegal transportation of a foreigner due to lack of enough evidences of exploitation. The woman who worked with the NRD cell office in Bumthang was therefore slapped a fine of 9,900 Ngutum in accordance with the Immigration Act of Bhutan. The defendant admitted to the court that she did not know the child was an Indian national while she brought her for adoption. The OAG accused the woman for trafficking the child from across the border through Gilifu in 2016. Witnesses submitted to the court that the child was cared for and given as much importance as the woman's own children while the child was under her custody. The case first surfaced in April last year when the Indian child was admitted to the hospital in Bumthang with serious injuries and infections on her body. The doctor then reported the case to police on suspicion of battery. The child was then said to have been kept under the custody of Renew and NCWC focal persons in Bumthang before she was taken to a place of safety in Thimpu. The child told NCWC officials that the woman battered and pushed her in fire, inflicting serious injuries and burns on her body. But it was not proved during the trial. The court instead penalised the woman with a fine of 180,000 Ngutum for neglecting the child's health while she was inflicted with injuries and infections. Meanwhile, the girl is said to be with her parents in India now. For Kip Chuin Bumtang, this is Tandin Finso for BBS News. And the Office of the Attorney General takes the case against seven people involved in the Labour Ministry's overseas employment scandal to the Thimpu District Court. The charge sheet against the seven individuals, including the Labour Ministry's Director General, concerns cases of overseas employment in Japan and India. In the Japan Overseas Employment Scheme involving Bhutan Employment Overseas and officials from the Labour Ministry, the OAG submitted to the court that the Director General of the Labour Ministry's Employment and Human Resource Department to be sentenced for a minimum of one year and a maximum of three years. The DG is accused of illegally assisting in the setting up of Bhutan Employment Overseas Office. The OAG has also moved the court to sentence a program officer under the DG's department to a maximum of three years. He is accused of recommending the Ministry of Economic Affairs to issue license without verifying the required documents. No charge sheet has been submitted against the Bhutan Employment Overseas since a criminal case is under investigation with the Royal Bhutan Police. In the India Overseas Employment Scandal, the same Director General is accused of failure to declare conflict of interest, deception and abuse of function. The OAG is requesting the District Court to sentence the DG to a maximum of three years on each count. In the same case, the OAG has requested to sentence the former Labour Minister to a minimum of one year and a maximum of three years on different counts of failure to declare assets, lying and deception and abuse of function. The OAG has submitted to the court to sentence two other individuals who assisted the former minister to a maximum of one year in prison. They are accused of keeping property and paying loans in their name which belong to the former minister. The former minister's wife has been requested to a maximum of one year sentence for being part of the scandal. And the DG's son has also been requested to be sentenced to a maximum of one year by the OAG. For Pema Seong, Nisha Gelson, BBS News. Not satisfied with Thimpu District Court's judgment, the Home Minister's lawyer is taking the case to the High Court. The lawyer said the Minister had valid comprehensive insurance and critical evidences were unattended by the Court. The lawyer added the conviction is fully based on the vague statement which prosecutor failed to prove with corroborating evidences. The District Court had sentenced the Home Minister Dasha Sharab Gelson to two months in prison for false vehicle insurance claim. The Home Minister had claimed more than 200,000 item from RICB as vehicle insurance for his Toyota Prado in June 2016, stating his vehicle met with an accident at Lamperie. He is asked to refund the amount. 
Meanwhile, in the same case, the Thimpu District Court sentenced four RICB officials and owner of an automobile workshop, ranging from one month to one year in prison. They are also appealing to the High Court. The former executive director Sunam Doji of RICB gets one year sentence. According to the judgment, he misused his position and changed the vehicle insurance cover of the Home Minister from third party to comprehensive scheme. He is also found guilty of asking his staff to change the scheme. RICBL's general manager Sangi Wangdi was sentenced to six months in prison for solicitation and asking his inspection officer Ugin Namjul to arrange blank receipt from automobile workshop to adjust bill. Ugin Namjul got one year sentence for forgery and deceptive practices. He arranged a blank receipt to adjust claims. He also signed the decision deceiving the claims committee to make the payment. Sangye Doji, also from RICB, also received one month term for aiding and abating as he signed the committee's resolution even after knowing the claim was false. Wenton Fenso, the owner of Tagap Workshop, was sentenced to six months in prison for issuing a blank receipt. But all of them can pay in lieu of imprisonment. For Pema Sawang, Pup Game for BBS News. In the next four years, the Labour and Human Resources Ministry plans to engage and support livelihoods of about 6,000 youth in the country with the launch of the Youth Engagement and Livelihood Program or YELP. YELP is a school to work transition program to provide job seekers with opportunities to enhance their skills and work experience. To start with, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the Ministry, the Construction Development Corporation Limited, Pelbar Lokchinyam Chilede, and the Youth Group of Panbang for the program. YELP program incorporates the government's aim to support livelihood of youths while being engaged productively in the construction and agriculture sectors. Around 1,500 job seekers will be supported through the program annually. The beneficiaries will be entitled to allowances as well. The program was developed based on the findings on the impact of direct employment scheme the Ministry and the Gross National Happiness Commission jointly carried out. Looking at the effectiveness of the program, the Commission recommended the Ministry to make it more engaging and inclusive. Uh, for me, uh, I'm less worried about uh, whether the program in its uh, inception is perfect. I think it has to be implemented and as we go along, there will be many flaws, there will be many loopholes, we will we'll come across many challenges, but what is more important is that when we come across challenges, when we are able, when we see the loopholes and the drawbacks of this program, we respond uh, swiftly to this and then try to uh, improve the program. And then I think that is, I think that will be the key to the success of, of this program in Omer and Nalevata. The Labour Ministry also launched its technical intern training program today. The program will enhance skills, knowledge and abilities of the Bhutanese workforce. Through this, youths will be placed for three years of internship in various implementing organizations in Japan with the possible extension of up to five years. Unlike the Learn and Earn program, the ministry will directly implement the technical intern training program. The technical intern training program is the outcome of Memorandum of Understanding that was signed in October last year. It has been designed in direct collaboration with Japanese government to allow our Bhutanese youths to pursue internship with Japanese employers. And unlike the Learn and Earn program, the technical intern training program this time hasn't been designed to send hundreds of youths together. It will be based on the needs and situation. That's why for the first batch, we have just 25 youths. The first batch, 25 key vacancies term. The employing agencies will pay stipend, facilitate the accommodation and logistics for the participants during the internship. Although the youths are expected to return home after the internship to join the labor market, they can choose to work in Japan if they get a working visa. Sunam Pem for BBS News. Towards the Zero Waste by 2030 mission, the National Environment Commission is hoping to collaborate with the Indian government to address waste management issues in the country. 
This was shared at a meeting with delegates from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change of India. Illegal dumping of wastes, lack of technical and financial resources, lack of storage facilities for biohazardous wastes, lack of expertise in electronic waste management, shortage of specialists in waste water treatment and coordination issues among agencies were some of the major challenges presented by the NEC during the meeting. To resolve all these issues by 2030, the meeting was held to discuss on a possible collaboration between the two countries. We had submitted a, a proposal at that point in time to the government of India for about 1.6 billion gultrums. It covers in terms of waste collection and management, waste uh, treatment and disposal, awareness raising, laboratory and capacity building. We will build a program based on our proposal and we have all the experts here to build it so that uh, we can have a project covering all elements and hopefully securing even uh, uh, financing and technology and capacity building uh, through experts uh, from India. He also added that the meeting is an outcome of the visit of the Environment Secretary of India, C.K. Mishra, in April, where NEC requested the government of India to help with waste management programs in Bhutan. Try and see and work out a way forward where maybe we can have MOU between the two countries on what all are the areas of cooperation which could possibly be entered into and see on a long term on capacity building, on institutional reforms, framework, if we can lay down an agenda and a roadmap for future. Uh, we have a large scientific manpower which is expertise in technology and waste management, processing, collection, transportation. So we would certainly be very happy if that scientific manpower could be utilized. Opportunities for collaboration both in technical and financial areas on waste management at national, district and local levels will also be thoroughly discussed in the closing meeting tomorrow. To manage waste properly and to fulfill the Zero Waste by 2030 mission, the National Environment Commission also developed a national waste management strategy which was launched by Her Majesty the Gelson in April this year. Reinforcement of the plastic ban, Zero Waste Hour program and sustainable tourism policy are some of the initiatives taken by the NEC so far to help address the waste management issue. This is Sring Dandu for BBS News. Hundreds of people who are confined to bed and have limited mobility due to illness, disability, accident or old age can now be able to manage their toilet routines independently. This comes as Bhutan Toilet Organization launches its first portable toilet called Chapto. Chapto will come to the rescue of many people who have difficulty using the ordinary toilets. The name Chapto was derived from an age-old practice of using a container as a toilet. Chapto is a small-sized portable toilet pot that can be easily lifted by two persons. It consists of a 40-liter tank and a seat which is optional for use. The back of the tank has a drain pipe through which the waste can be dumped. In the past when people could not go outside to attend a nature call due to old age or illness, they used to keep a container near the patient called as Chapto. Chapto is for people who are ill and for old people who are not able to use the ordinary toilets. It's like toilet visiting the people instead of people going to the toilet. It's comfortable and it does not smell as well. After encountering real-life incidences of people with grave problems using the ordinary toilets, the organization planned and decided to come up with a solution. When we imported bedside toilets from Bangkok, that's when I realized that there were many facing problems going to toilets. There was a huge demand. When we looked at it, the cost involved in it was huge, considering the travel cost. That's when we decided to build our own. It is made in Bhutan and costs nearly 11,000 newton. This is Sring Dandu for BBS News. A team of four high school students from Thimpu are set to become the first Bhutanese to participate at the World Robot Games Championship to be held in Thailand. 
The World Robot Games is an international robotics competition held annually for all ages of participants to promote science, technology and innovation. Weighing almost 3 kilograms each, it took these four students from Pelkil School and Druk School two months to build the four robots. The team spent nearly 40,000 newton on the project. The team received contributions from several sponsors who helped them build the robots and will also be funding their trip at the upcoming World Championship. The team did not have to compete for a place in the championship since they received a direct invitation from the World Robot Games. My teammates, they went to Nepal uh, this year in the beginning and um, the ball was made from scraps and it wasn't as efficient as effective and as effective from those robots that were already there. So keeping that in mind, uh, with the help of our sponsors, we ordered things from online, Drupis, and then uh, we made our robot with new components. So we're hoping our robot will put up a good fight with those robots from other countries this time. The team will take part in the rugby robot category and will fight against 29 teams from 10 countries. Rugby is a team spot where a plum-shaped ball is brought to the end goal to score. The game will have four robots on each side trying to go after the same ball to score the goal and win the match. Representing Bhutan for the first time in the competition, the team feel that this is just the beginning for Bhutan in the world of robotics. The world is developing really fast and you know, learning this, it's going to help us a lot. And in the future, when other countries develop, I think we can play a huge role in helping the country's development with robotics. Because robotics is the future. Uh, from every day, driving a car, the laptops you use, the printers, they are all technology. Uh, and then we have to keep up with the times that are changing. The winning team will get a cash prize of 300,000 Thai baht. The competition will be held for three days. More than 560 participants from around 10 countries will compete in 14 different categories at the World Robot Games. Sunam Pem for BBS News. Pema Thachuk won the 2019 Mr. Bhutan title at the 10th edition of the National Bodybuilding and Physique Championship, defeating eight other competitors. Cementing his legacy as the two-time Mr. Bhutan, he will be sponsored by the Bhutan Bodybuilding Association for the upcoming Asian Championship in Indonesia. Pemo Thechuk was the 2014 Mr. Bhutan. The newly crowned national champion also bagged bronze in the 2016 Asian Championships. He owns a gym in Finsaling. The former three-time Mr. Bhutan, Tandin Wangchin, stood second. In the men's physics category, Toshisoki emerged victorious after beating 13 other contestants. He is the bronze medalist in South Asian Championship held in Nepal this year. And Yudan, participating for the first time, won the women's model physics category. She was closely followed up by Song Dema. This is Sringdandu for BBS News. Well, that's all for this week. Thank you for joining us.